I would definitely be open-minded. No one's journey is going to look the same. So what worked for me, what doors opened and what path I went down is not gonna be how someone else's journey is. And if you are so focused on being exactly like the other person, you're gonna miss every opportunity that is presented to you. Welcome to the Food Grads Podcast, the podcast where I take you on a fascinating journey into the hearts and minds of the amazing people who work in the food, beverage, and hospitality industries. I'm your host, Veronica Hislop, a molecular science graduate student and career partner with Food Grads. On episode six of the Food Grads Podcast, I interview Elizabeth Hagerman, a food scientist at the Warrell Corporation. The Warrell Corporation is one of the top contract candy manufacturing companies in North America, which focuses on chocolate panning, fire roasting, brittles, nut clusters, and better for you snacks. In this episode, Elizabeth and I talk about her sweet job at the Warrell Corporation and what it means to be a middleman company. Elizabeth then goes on to talk about why she loves her job and the challenges she's faced through working on caramel related projects. Elizabeth also discusses with me her current endeavor of working towards a master's degree in global food law and how the idea came to be. We also talk about PMCA, the Professional Manufacturing Confectioners Association, and how we are both a part of the student outreach program. If you haven't heard of PMCA, then check them out. They are an amazing association doing so much for the industry. Overall, Elizabeth is such a cool person. You can tell she is well suited for being a food scientist because of her can-do attitude. She is willing to take on new challenges because she knows it will allow for her to grow as a person. You'll really be able to tell that in this episode, and I think that her story is one that we could all learn from. Well, with that, I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really excited to have someone in the confectionery industry. I know, I think a lot of people think that that's their uh, dream profession to go into so it'll be really fun to just get to know it a little bit more. Absolutely thank you for having me. Could you tell me a little bit about the Worrell Corporation and that the products that they produce? Sure so Worrell is a 50 plus year old company that's been around as a contract manufacturing company so we're kind of like the middleman for any size company small to your big CPG companies that you are more well known. And we do everything from conception and ideation all the way to commercialization and production of confectionery based products. So that's your chocolate covered pretzels to chocolate covered peanuts. And then we do some more sugar based products, which are like fire roasted nuts and clusters. We used to do caramel and taffy, and that's kind of where I started. But after a couple changes, we no longer have that side of the business, but it's definitely fun. It's always changing and definitely puts me on my toes trying to figure out new ideas. That's really cool. It sounds like you've got your hand in a lot of different things, but could you just explain a little bit more what you mean by a middleman company? Because I think that a lot of people think like when we think of companies, we just think directly to consumer. So what would be like a middleman company more so? So yeah, I didn't really know too much when I first started at Warrell. The middleman is usually that like silent partner that no one really knows about, but somehow the products get out all the time. We're kind of that extra hand for some of the bigger name companies that can't produce certain concept in their own house and they need to kind of contract it out to another company or we also do private label products where we make a basic, you know, peanut brittle and put several different names on it, whether it's CVS or it's a Rite Aid or a Kroger type of thing. So we, we get our hand in a little bit of everything and get to experience different aspects of the business. That's really cool because I, like I said before, I know we always think of the big name brands. So it's cool to know that there might be a lot of companies that are out there having a big hand in some of the things that we eat every day, but we don't really notice that they're there in that 
middle section helping out. So that's really cool. Yeah. So in terms of you, let's focus on you. Um, what is your role at the corporation and what does your day to day look like? So the official title is food technologist, but that can cover anything from come join five different meetings in one day or come out to the plant and help us figure out what's wrong with this chocolate. So day-to-day changes, I would say, by the hour. Typically, I would be formulating or making new recipes up based on feedback from potential customers or current customers on new product developments that we've been working on to troubleshooting, making products more efficient on our lines and making sure we're getting the best possible quality and safety as our top priorities. Yeah, it's a little bit all over the board. I get to ideate some days and have fun and innovate new products. And then some days I get to sit in a meeting and try and convince people that they shouldn't really focus on going all keto all day when there's plenty of people who like chocolate and peanut butter together and would rather see that indulgent product versus a better for you healthy candy. (laughs) So it definitely sounds like you use a lot of different skills throughout whether it be in those meetings or convincing someone to do um, something or um, creating a new project. So that's pretty cool. So it sounds like something that doesn't get boring. No, absolutely not. It's always a new adventure every day I come in. Tailing onto that, we, I know we're talking about like flexibility, but what are some of the things that you love about your job right now? Right now, I love, I honestly love trying to come at the challenge from a different perspective. So we've been challenged, I've personally been challenged to look at sugar reduction within candy, which is like trying to take milk out of butter. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. So it's very difficult, but I enjoy that. Many people outside of the research and development department are like, I I don't even want your job because that sounds too sciencey and too much but I, I, I love it. That's one of the reasons why I went into food science. But also I get, I'm going for my master's in global food law right now. So I get to work with our legal team and look at uh, different contracts that we're working on and really understanding what priority of the recipe is considered URLs and what is considered the customers. And I would say as a food technologist, it's very good to know what you're allowed to share with other possible customers and what you're not supposed to share with other customers. I I never really got that full disclosure when I was in school. So definitely something I got to learn and kind of latched onto. Whoa, that's really cool. I've never even considered someone in your position getting a degree in that. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Like, how did, how did you even decide to, because that's a very different master's to go into as opposed to something you would think science-based. So how, how did that start to come to be? How, how has been the process in going into that degree? It kind of came to be as a, uh, a joke. Uh, I was trying to figure out what, what like my next step was. I'm like, I, I've been working here for about three and a half years and I'm like, I, I want to do something else and I want to grow my career. So where could I possibly go? And uh, I was talking to one of my mentors. He, he's a great guy, Scott, and kind of just threw it out there because I was doing some research, different master programs that are out there. I really didn't want to go back fully to school and do strong science-based background where I have a friend who's looking at milk microbes in cows and I really didn't want to do that. (laughs) So 
I, I found this degree at Michigan State and it's fully online. It's a global food law course where I, I get to learn all of those aspects within both US law, but also international food law and what legally is considered safe, what's legally considered food, how contracts should be written when it's a mutual agreement between two parties. So I always find that stuff very interesting. Many people might find it dry, but I like to argue a lot. So I think it's a good avenue for me to go down. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That is so interesting. In in this program, it's fully it's fully focused on food. Yep, it's fully focused on food. Uh, we touch a little bit on you know uh, beverages and kind of raw materials, but it's more understanding the food supply chain and how. I had one class about on how food is probably one of the easiest things to manipulate and change and adulter. So when it goes through different trade zones, people can repackage it and sell it as something else. And you don't know if it's an actual food product that is from one of your big CPG companies or if it's a counterfeit product. So looking at it that way and seeing that there's all these, not only the FBI, but there's private sectors that are looking into counterfeit products and keeping our supply chain safe. Yeah, that is pretty cool. I know that when I was doing um, quality assurance and we were doing the SQF program, I know that food adulteration became like a really big segment and how to protect your customers from experiencing that and how you can ensure that the suppliers that you're bringing in the products aren't adulterating it. So it sounds like you came up with for something that came up with a joke as a starting. That sounds like a really cool avenue to um, set yourself on up and as well it's something it'll be really good for you to have like those two sets of minds to be going so you have like your food technologist by day and um, <laughs> food law by night so that's a really I never even thought that they would have a program that's like so specified and dedicated to that field and that's and was it always an online program or was it something that came up because of the current crisis it was actually always an online program many people, industry personnel that are, that have been in the industry or recently retired or are looking new avenues have been looking at taking this master's program. So it was kind of forged to go with the nine to five worker who is a certain person during the day. And at night they're doing these online classes to get this master's degree. That is so cool, once again, and for something to work in someone's schedule, I think that's something I'll definitely look into, and I mean, I'm doing a master's program right now. I'm doing my molecular science degree, so I'm doing exactly what you were trying to avoid right now, <laughs> but for me, it's been a dream come true just because I've never actually taken a food science program, so for me, that's exactly why I wanted to do it, but I think it's something that'll be really cool to keep in mind because like, that'll definitely differentiate you I think from a lot of places and it can definitely open up your horizon so very smart choice <laughs> thank you <laughs> so we'll bring it back though to um, what you're doing in your your day job <laughs> and um, I know that we talk about the confectionaries and such so um, without getting too specific um, what has been some of your favorite projects that you've worked at so far so I've worked on quite a few projects in the short three and a half years I've been here. Warrell, when I first started, Warrell had a classic caramel sector that did pretty much the industry bulk caramel that you see at fairs and caramel apples and all that sort of thing, but also they did taffy. And so I had my hand in several projects. Some were launching different flavored taffies for a customer that is out in Colorado and is still thriving out in Colorado. And another one was a liquid caramel that got to go into a coffee beverage, which I thought was one of the best things because those were two of my favorite things ever. I think my typical Starbucks order is a caramel latte and 
that kind of contradicts that I don't like eating caramel anymore because I'm sick and tired of it, but I still <laughs> buy that drink because it's my favorite. So figure that out as you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think the liquid caramel in the, it was a ready to drink coffee beverage and it's actually still out on the market. Um, and I guess since we don't make it anymore, it was La Colombe coffee, which La Colombe coffee by itself is incredible. If you haven't had that, if you're you just go online to La Colombe, it's really good. But we got to add caramel to it and it was just, I, I thought it was incredible. It was a big project for us since it had to be refrigerated from start to finish. And it was something we've never done. So this is a company that made 10,000 pounds of caramel in an eight hour shift and with no problem. And now they have to do 10,000 pounds of caramel in an eight hour shift and it has to be refrigerated. Plus it needs to get quality controlled and it's not allowed to leave the facility. So it was a lot of moving parts and logistics to try and figure out. And I was very proud and very anxious to launch this product. So the logistics could play out and everything seemed to work out as we kept running. So I, I was very proud of that one. Wow, it sounds like you should be, especially to go from, as you were mentioning, a facility that wasn't, if I'm not mistaken, focused on something that's refrigerated and to go from something that is so out of your wheelhouse, but the the Warrell, they were able to make it within their wheelhouse, let's just say, with all those challenges and bring that all together. That's just a feat in showing cooperation between different departments. So that's amazing. Yes, it was. It was definitely a lot of persuading and guilt tripping for a little while and proving that I, I would come in at 5 a.m. even though I'm not really a morning person and would get my hands dirty and make sure everything got through the way it needed to. Because it sounds like you put a lot of effort into this and it for a place to take on a project that's so different than what its own, um, did you use any I don't want to say tactics or tips, but was there anything that helped you kind of stand behind that you knew what you were doing was right or this project should continue from your perspective? It, it seemed to start going off without a hitch. Like we're like, all right, this could be in our wheelhouse, but a lot of people said, let's worry about like logistics, like that whole refrigeration thing later. And, and let's just focus on, yeah, we can make caramel for you. And I didn't like that approach because I knew later was going to come way too fast. And then everyone was going to go all crazy and say, we can't actually do this. And then we're going to kill the project. And I, I don't want to spend that much time on a project. And then it just disintegrates when we could have made it better and, and helped it along the way. So definitely I found myself sticking to my guns and working with our quality team working with our definitely our production team to keep reassuring like it, it's a it's close to x product that we've been making for 20 some odd years it the only change is we're going to refrigerate it now rather than take it downstairs and get ready to ship in two days. So I, I think once we got through, we did a trial and we trialed everything out and anything that could go wrong went wrong during the trial. So it was a very good thing to have the trial. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That just goes to show that uh, plant trials, I, I bet anyone who's done any remote product development knows that it's the plant trial that is really a defining factor. And I'll show you where things are going to move forward with. <laughs> so, Absolutely. <laughs> let's shift back to, or let's shift our attention more. So um, I mentioned before we were getting into recording this podcast that we both have been involved in some way with the PMCA, the Professional Manufacturers Confectioners Association. This association, I've been really happy that I've had the 
chance to be a part of just as their student outreach program, which is, like I've said, one of the most ex amazing experiences that I have had in my university career, because um, when I did do it the first year, I got to meet so many great mentors and I got to do a factory tour as well as eat a lot of chocolate and candy. <laughs> like, okay, there was plates of candy everywhere. So maybe that alone was enough to um, do something. And for me personally, it was my first big event in the United States. So that's big because I'm from Canada. So anyways, <laughs> with you though, um, how have you been involved with PMCA? So I actually started out kind of like you did with the student outreach program. I counted it up. I've been attending, if I went in 2020, it would have been my eighth year attending. So I attended four years as a student through the outreach program and loved every minute of it. And then roles were reversed and I became one of the industry people that attended PMCA for industry needs and networking and meeting new suppliers. And it, it was a complete like 180 trying to switch my mindset from oh, I'm just a student and I, I just like to eat all the candy that's here and listen to all these amazing talks to, I'm actually going to have a business meeting over lunch with X supplier about this project that I'm working on. And so I thought that was really cool in the way that PMCA can coordinate that so seamlessly. I'm sure there's like thousands of things going on behind the scenes that we don't know about, but I always thought that was an amazing use of time. This past year, well, 2019, I got to speak at PMCA, which was terrifying and insane, but I, I was very proud that I was able to do that and give back to an organization that gave me so much. How did you... Um... So for the talk, if I'm not mistaken, you talked about research and development and I, too bad I wasn't a part of the student outreach program. That was the one year that I was working. So I unfortunately didn't attend, but um, how did it come about? And did you get a lot of experience from it or did you grow as a person from the whole conference? So I was asked about a year in advance if I'd be willing to write a paper about sugar crystallization in pretty much in caramel or in confectionery products and talk about from an R&D perspective how to combat crystallization and I, I go back to Scott who I kind of lean on he's my industry I guess guru or personal <laughs> venting person I, I don't know <laughs> I don't know how to explain him, but I think everyone should have a Scott, just throwing that out there. But I kind of talked to him and said, this is pretty big. It, it's maybe like between 200 and 400 people, plus it's all going to be recorded. So whoever wants to watch it later on. So I, I have no idea how many people will actually see that, but it's to a room of people that I look up to and kind of crave their approval. So I don't want to do them wrong, but I would love to just put my spin on what I've witnessed. So it was a lot of different um, thoughts going in my head, but it was definitely something that grew me as a person. It opened up my public speaking brain again and definitely made me want to do it again, I would talk about whatever at this point and go up there with no problem. I'll still probably be anxious right beforehand, like I was before, but uh, I can get over that quickly. It's really cool. And you did touch upon how having a mentor is so important. And I know that I've personally, I have one lady that I work with, and, or I shouldn't say work with, but I have my own mentor. And it's really been good for me as well because I always find that if I have like a, 
a problem, not a problem, but if there's somewhere in place I think I need to grow, or there's even a place I need to grow and I don't even realize that I need to grow in my skill set, I find that having that mentor is just that person to be there. And it's nice to have someone on a professional level that you feel comfortable with because you might you might have a good supervisor or a boss at work. And even though you're on really good terms with them, there's certain areas you might not feel um, comfortable talking about you want to be growing with. So having that external mentor, I think, has been really helpful for me. And I'm, I agree with you. I think that everyone should have a Scott in their uh, corner. <laughs> so let's um, move back. So you went to Oregon University for food science, and I know that you were heavily involved in their food science club. What made you decide to get so heavily involved in your club when you've already, you were already in a program that you learned food science? I fell in love with the program at Oregon State and I, I wanted a practical way that there is something that changes when you're sitting there and going through different classes and you're going through the motions like you're learning biology and, and then you're learning about cheese making and then sensory and that whole gamut of food science background. But there's something about getting in a group of like-minded individuals who are all there for the same reason because they love food or in our case we had a lot of people that love beer <laughs> and, and just getting to pretty much talk science and talk about what kind of things make food tick make beer what beer is and it was kind of a way for us to practically see what we were learning in class on a kind of three-dimensional area. It, it was pretty much something that we all just got together and we could talk about, all right, we just did this in food chemistry. How, how does that actually perform in like, coffee or, or when you mix different sour products together. So it was a way to build connections and it was a way to um, kind of give us that lab experience, but not under the same issued labs that we need to do for our degree. So when you were um, a part of this, you're, you're mentioning labs. With your club, you had access to lab facilities? So we had access to our pilot plant that was kind of open. We did, I want to say, bi-weekly club brews. So we, our pilot plant had a full, I want to say it was a four-barrel system, and we produced wort. Well, we produced wort at the beginning of beer making, and then some people would bring different food like lunch or breakfast or tacos, and we would talk about the different fermentation things going on within that particular brew session. And then we would talk, we would have jam making sessions and use the local farms would send in some raspberries or blackberries and we would make different types of jams and we would add different acids to it to see what would change within the profile. Uh, we did a bread making lab where our professor, who's pretty much a doctor of bread making, <laughs> ran this wonderful, it was like an four hour long course but we ended up taking home loaves of bread which everyone in my apartment loved so that is so cool like that is so awesome because of course you're going to learn this type of stuff in school or through your courseware but to have a club where I think that you probably were able to better retain the information as well because you also have like social com conversations with some other people in the club and to be able to kind of pick out projects that you think the club would like to do. I think that makes experiences more memorable, not only for a technical standpoint, but as well just for good long-term 
things that you can remember from your university days. So that is so cool. And I wish I had that experience. (laughs) With that, I know that um, the transition period for a lot of students, especially now between going from your undergraduate to either going into your work career or choosing to go to a master's degree. How was that transition for you between undergraduate and your full-time career? And do you think that there was anything that contributed to you to be successful to even get a position outside of school? So definitely the transition between undergrad to career. uh, You kind of think your senior year, whenever you finally graduate and are ready to take that next step, you think that um, you're going to have something lined up right as you graduate and then you're going to go straight into a wonderful job or your first career moving job and sometimes that's the case in my case i graduated in june of 2016 and i got my first i I would say food science job in that august and it was as a r d technician and i would run around and do all the weighing and sample prep and taste tests for the food scientists who've been there for five, 10 years. And I I learned quite a bit in that short time, but it was that mindset of, all right, I'm not going to class every single day, or I'm not hanging out with these people or dealing with clubs or, or doing those sorts of things. I'm going to work from nine to five or eight to four and have actual projects I need to focus on. And I would say that transition, I definitely had to keep an open mind. I really didn't have any expectations of what I was hoping to gain from that experience. I was just trying to absorb everything as it came along and trying to do the best I can and ask the questions that I needed to. Yeah, that's, that's good advice because I know with when you get into your first career, it can be, it can be challenging to not make your expectations so high. I think that we are ahead of our own selves where we have so much of this, this knowledge we learned in university and you know, we seem like we've been doing great for those four years, but then when we go into our career, it's like we want to be senior scientists before it even happens. So um, it's better to just step back and just absorb everything you learn because it will really help you in the, in the long run. And I think that it's good to just listen. And I think that young people, including myself, I can't say for you, but it can be, you just want to show and do everything. And sometimes you just need to step back and just listen and just absorb what's going on around you. Uh, Even today, I have to step back and listen and hear all the different possibilities. You you can't just jump on saying my answer is the right answer and, and not listen to anybody else. So I definitely agree to that. And because of that, I also wanted to know, um, because you are still fairly early on in your career, have there been any challenges that you faced so far that um, you were able to overcome or an experience you'd like to share? So I think I've noticed two, two big challenges. And it's not just after talking with several other of my friends who are within the same, this industry and actually other industries and we're around the same age. It's more of, you have the imposter syndrome where you, you're standing here, you could be three and a half years in, or you can be a year into your career, and you still don't think that you're supposed to be in that position. You're really supposed to be below that. Like, at some point, something's going to give, and people are going to say, well, you really don't know that much. So you may just want to take a step down. And I would say to that, um, definitely challenging yourself and going out of your comfort zone to prove that you're really not an imposter. You're just learning. So uh, I'm three, 
three and a half years in and just last year we had the opportunity we're working on making our production lines more efficient and effective so I volunteered myself to run a cross-functional team and um, was very surprised that I did that because I kind of kicked myself after I volunteered but then realized that that's the only way that I'm going to learn how to lead a group of contradicting personalities and pretty much trying to steer all of them into one generalized goal for that team. So I, I would say that challenge is one that's staying in the back of my head, but definitely trying to overcome it every day. The other challenge would be, I am the youngest person in the company. And if I let it go to my head, then uh, I kind of think that people will see me as a naive young millennial who doesn't want anything to do with the older generations and just likes avocado toast and moves on from there and watches Netflix all the time. I do watch Netflix and I do like avocado toast, but it's definitely making sure that I know what I know and I'm going to ask the questions that I need to and the way I present myself. I'm definitely learning certain ways that I should present myself and certain ways I should not present myself. So definitely understanding how you show up into a room and pretty much own what you say. I try and back everything that I say with as much knowledge and at least as many people who understand what I'm trying to do when I get my point across. With the times that I know there'll be situations where there will be times when you don't know and that you don't want to be, you don't want to bring up that imposter syndrome. Is there anything that you do in the situations where you don't know something? How do you present yourself? So there have been quite a few times where I honestly don't know the answer. And rather than saying, you know, you should actually and, and play it off as I do know what I'm talking about, but I'm just going to feed you a bunch of stuff until you guys figure out what the answer is. And then I'll just say, yeah, that's the right answer. Uh, I'm honest with myself and with those around me because I trust the group that's around me who have been there for several years before me or who have new perspectives of this topic and I'll say this is what I know and what I don't know is x and if none of us know what x is then all right that's where we start but if let's say some people in maintenance might know what x is but they don't know how to get there that's how we can work together to get to X. And that's how I also learn. It's never a bad thing to say you don't know. It is a very bad thing if you say you do know and then you really don't because then that's where people could get hurt and you have safety issues within that. And it's just a big mess if you go that route. I think that's a really, that's a good answer because I think that's something that I've never also taken to consideration as well is I know that we have that feeling that we want to know everything but you mentioning about safety I guess that would be something that's really important not only from a physical point like you know getting hurt in the plant but also from a food safety point so I think if you can back yourself up behind that as well that is a good good way to also think about be, be welcoming to ask questions and if you can show the things you kind of already know the way you're saying it, the why, and you're still looking for the X, I think that does show that even though you're not at the point to know something, you can still prepare yourself and work together with others without seeming like you don't care. 
and I think I guess that's a really important part there is you have to just show that even though you don't know you care about the end but you have done your research to the extent that you can absolutely I wanted to ask why is the food industry a great place to work and why did you specifically choose confectionaries so I think I honestly think the food industry is kind of one of those Wizard of Oz things. Like you, you don't know what's behind the curtain and it's not like many people open the curtain that much to the general public to understand this is really how your food is made. I mean, there are books and there are different documentaries that talk about it, but actually being a part of that, being in a lab or being in a kitchen developing new ideas that will potentially be on grocery store shelves for the next generation is really fascinating to think about. I I remember being that person like picking up goldfish and saying who actually thought of making a cheese cracker look like a fish. That's funny, actually, you mentioned that too. I know with the PMCA outreach program, um, I was just re-watching one of our webinars from this past year, and one of the other mentors was actually specifically saying about how goldfish were the ones that really made him think, whoa, the food industry is so cool, and I wonder how someone made this, so <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. But you are right, it is really cool to know how much is behind a product that seems so humble on the shelf, how many people are behind it and how much thought's been gone into it. Yeah. And for the confectionery world, I, I think I fell in love with the industry from PMCA meeting all of these um, incredible people that work for competing, competing um, companies, but hang out with each other like they're best friends or they look forward to meeting up at PMCA or IFT or any of the shows just to say hi and see what's up and check and see how the family is. I I always thought the camaraderie between um, industry personnel was incredible. You you think of Mars and Hershey are like bitter rivals and no one's going to associate with the other, but then no one's wearing their Hershey shirt or their Mars or whatever at shows like PMCA, they're all sitting together talking about, oh, what have you been do- up to and talking about new projects and not disclosing too much, but they're having fun while they're doing it. That's pretty awesome. I mean, I would never think about having such um, people so comforting and um, collab not collaborative but just sitting down and talking as just on a real personal level not only on a per- not only on a like a professional level generally but on a personal level and like talking about families and all that like you're right you would just think that they would be at odds and ends with each other but for something to be like that in the confectionery industry I think I can understand why you would choose to want to be in that area yeah So we're coming to the end of the podcast. So I just wanted to ask you just a few more questions. First of which is, what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career that's similar to yours? I would definitely be open-minded. No one's journey is going to look the same. So what worked for me, what doors opened and what path I went down is not going to be how someone else's journey is. And if you are so focused on being exactly like the other person, you're gonna miss every opportunity that is presented to you. And also, uh, I, I think I've said it way too many times and I'm pretty sure if Scott actually listens to this podcast, he's going to call me up and say, you have to stop talking about me, but <laughs> find yourself a Scott, find yourself a industry mentor that you can not necessarily thrive off of, but you can call them and say, all right, uh, how do you deal with difficult people? Or how do you, how do I work better within this industry? Or how do, 
ask all your questions to someone you trust and that is willing to kind of work with you and build you up and help you grow in your career. I totally agree. Mentors are valuable resources for both just even sometimes just having someone to back you up. That's all you sometimes need in certain situations. So I definitely have to agree with that. And for the more fun question, I always just like to ask our guests, um, do you have any food industry related books, podcasts, or just anything or people that you think students that should check out? Uh, so podcasts, I've been listening to the America America's Test Kitchen. They, it's called Proof. And it's really, it's really cool. They go through, like, they pick different products. There was one about Oreos and going through the whole history of where the name Oreo came from and how it came to be a, a America's favorite cookie and, and just things like that. I would say books. One of my favorites is The Poison Squad by Deborah Blum. It's all about how really how the Food and Drug Administration within the United States was formed and how the legal levels of different really poisons were determined. So figuring out how much arsenic can actually be within rice and not kill anybody was one of the topics that they talked about. So I, I, I'm one of those mystery thriller type people. So I thought that book was really cool. That's awesome. I, I've heard a little bit about the story of what you were just mentioning and it's really interesting. So I would recommend that as a read as well, but I'm going to be checking out that podcast that you told me about because I've kind of been held off about it because I was like, how could America's Test Kitchen, which is known for the recipes in that kind of translate to more of a podcast listening form or a long, long form podcast. So I'm definitely going to be adding that to my list, especially Oreos, because I love Oreos. Yeah. I really enjoyed this talk and I'm really happy that we were able to connect. But for those who wanted to know a little more about you, um, where can people find you or connect with you? So I'm on LinkedIn um, under Elizabeth Hagerman and I, I do have an Instagram. I mean, it's not that much uh, on food, but I try and throw food and my dog on there. So I, I can send you that. That's, I think, Jersey Liz 94. Uh, I don't know. I forget what that name is. No problem. I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes if anyone wants to uh, find you on that. So Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being on the show. I really enjoyed it. I think this was fun. And I definitely think that the confectionery industry is definitely something that I think people should check out. It's not just because it's one of the funnest things you can work with, it sounds like, but also because it has great people. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you for listening to episode six of the Food Grads podcast. If you want to find any of the show notes for this episode, then check out the podcast tab on the Food Grads website. This is the homepage for any past and future episodes. If you're listening to this podcast, then please consider rating and reviewing the episode and anywhere you get your podcasts. This helps us to get promoted to more people, which would be greatly appreciated. Next week on the podcast, I interview Victor Malil, the founder and technical director for the Risk Optimization Resource Center, a center which provides an innovative new way of training to teach the next generation of food safety professionals. In this episode, we talk about why jobs in food safety are so in demand and why a new approach to training is needed in order to create a better food safety system. I can't wait to share this episode with you. See you next week.